Let's take a look at money, inflation in correlation with the quantity theory of money and monetary policy, especially under the limelight of recent global financial crisis. First, let's cover some fundamentals before taking a look at the quantity theory of money relevant for inflation and lastly, how monetary policy changed during the crisis. Let's start with the fundamentals. Money is the medium of exchange in every market economy. National governments and central banks are in charge of defining what money is in their economies, i.e. coining and printing it. M1 stands for currency and demand deposits, that is all most liquid assets. M2 comprises of all M1 assets plus short-term deposits, like savings accounts, small-time deposits, and money market mutual funds, and so forth. The illustration provides an overview of the proportions of M1 and M2 components in the U.S. from 1959 to 2009 and the rising amount of total savings accounts. The price of money affects variables like interest rates, exchange rates, and the aggregate price level. Let's look at these variables a little closer. First, the, market, uh, the price relative to time is the interest rate. In other words, the interest rate is the price of holding the money. When investing, you may want to borrow from a bank when the price or interest rate is lower than the expected ROI. Generally, when interest rates increase, money becomes more expensive and the cost of buying becomes higher. Hence, rising interest rates tend to slow the growth of output in an economy, negatively affecting the real GDP growth. The exchange rate, or FX rate, is the price of foreign currency relative to domestic currency expressed proportionally. Whenever country A's FX rate depreciates, foreigners find it cheaper to buy the country A's currency and final goods resulting in a trade balance surplus for country A. On the flip side of the coin though, depreciating FX rates also mean that foreign currencies and foreign goods appear more expensive to country A's citizens, reducing their overall purchasing power. The aggregate price level reflects the average uh, price level of all goods or services in money terms in a period. <coughs> Under healthy macroeconomic conditions, prices for individual goods and services constantly change following supply and demand. However, during deflation, the aggregate price level is decreasing. Some prices fall faster than others, and the value of money increases. During inflation, the aggregate price level is increasing, and the value of money decreases. Importantly, inflation must be considered when talking about normal and real GDP growth. Arguably, the most important player in the continuing assessment is the central bank. The central bank can increase the money supply by printing money and pumping it into the economy. In simplified terms, economists typically expect interest rates to fall and a country's exchange rate to depreciate. Thus, money growth tends to drive up the price level. In other words, with more cash available, consumers are more likely to consume even more. Following simple supply and demand logics, that increased demand causes higher prices in the short run or higher inflation. The exact opposite effect is visible whenever the central bank decreases the money supply. Let's talk about inflation briefly. Inflation is a sustained increase in the general level of prices for goods and services. One of the main causes of inflation is demand pull inflation, or as the economist Milton Friedman put it, too much money is chasing too few goods. That is typically true for growing economies in the short run. Another cause is the cost push inflation, visible whenever companies' costs like sticky wages or tax increases lead to increased prices to maintain profit margins. But the real question is, is inflation anticipated or not? Under anticipated inflation, banks and employees could adjust interest rates and working contracts, whereas unanticipated inflation causes uncertainty. Some win and some lose. Ultimately, you and me should worry whether inflation is rising at a higher pace than our salaries. Inflation is a sign of a growing economy. It is simply the process from booming economies and rising price levels to move to long-term equilibria along the long-run aggregate supply curve. To show how the quantity theory of money affects inflation, let's take a closer look at it. During classical economic thinking, the Yale economist Irving Fisher formalized the quantity equation MV equals PY. M stands for the cash and demand deposits. V stands for velocity of circulation or how many times a unit of money is used to buy final goods or services. P stands for the average price level. And Y representing the real quantity output of goods or services in a period. Given the two products, we could say MV equals the nominal value of all transactions over a period and PY equals the nominal GDP over that period. Given the equation, if MV grows, 
Py must also grow by the same amount. During that time, velocity changes were rather small and constant. Also, real economic output was rather constant. So, their belief was that only a constant change in the money supply could raise inflation, fueling arguments for later monetary theory. Now, let's tweak this equation a little bit and rewrite the equation. We can now see that the growth rate of money supply plus the growth of velocity must equal the growth of price levels plus growth of quantity output from one period to the next. Aaron Fisher now argued that the velocity of money stays constant over time, meaning there won't be any growth, thus we can take it out of the equation like that. Now we know that another expression for P is inflation and we want to solve for inflation as follows. Inflation rate equals the growth rate of the money supply minus the growth rate of real output. Hence, if money supply grows faster than real GDP growth, we end up with inflation. <clears throat> and the exact opposite situation is true, uh, resulting in deflation. Now the issue today is that higher usage of electronic payment systems and higher interest rates typically result in the higher velocity of money. So Irving Fisher was not entirely correct. The velocity of money is not constant. <clears throat> the long run though, inflation results from the money supply growing at a faster rate than the real GDP. The prerequisite for any monetary policy is to understand conclusions from the quantity theory of money. It heavily depends on the key assumption that velocity is constant. If it is not constant, there is no direct link between increases in money supply and increase of the price level, because consequently, an increase in the quantity of money could be offset by a decline in velocity. Hence, there is no effect on the price level. Because velocity can move fast in the short run, the quantity th uh, equation is not the best tool for forecasting inflation in the short run. However, in the long run, there is a strong link between changes in the money supply and inflation. In other words, most of the variation in inflation rates could, uh, across decades could actually be explained by variation in the rates of growing from the money supply. Countries with a rapid growth of money supply tend to have high inflation and slow economic growth rates and vice versa. Steering interest rates and hence the money supply in an economy is one of the most important responsibilities of a central bank and its monetary policy. The relationship between the public and firms, the government and banks, is a basic but fundamentally important factor to understand in the dependencies and possible knockoff effects. Even before, but certainly during the crisis, governments were faced with high public spending and debt. Deflationary tendencies are visible, especially in the south of Europe. People are most living, mostly living from credit card to credit card bill, especially in the United States. Companies are holding off their investments, mainly because banks' lending activities contracted heavily, also known as the credit crunch. Relating that phenomenon to the quantity equation now, the money supply and the velocity actually decreased. Now, the role of the central bank becomes increasingly important. To the most prominent conventional uh, policy is lowering the nominal short-term interest rates, creating stimulus for investments and consumption. Even more so, the central banks might even consider open market operations like buying or selling maturity government bonds, direct cash infusions into banks, and so on, all increasing the money supply. The financial crisis begins to unwind, exposing massive real estate bubbles due to the low nominal interest rate, which actually could not be decreased any further below the zero lower bound. Due to trust issues and shocks from CDO sales, many banks proceeded hoarding cash, while others simply collapsed resulting in massive bailout programs from governments. Huge public deficit and moral hazard are just two of the very obvious consequences. Clearly, unconventional times require unconventional measures, such as quantitative easing, where a central bank buys securities directly from the market, aiming at lowering interest rates and increasing the money supply. One cannot overstate that for any economy, and especially during rough times, one thing is very important, that is expectations. For guidance, i.e. the promise from the central bank to longer maintain low interest rates has been used in order to create a more positive or at least a more stable outlook. To conclude, there is a huge debate currently in monetary policy. Theoretical concepts on all forms of policy have been created and experiences from past recessions, i.e., Japan, the United States, or Argentina have been reviewed. One might agree that with each individual policy in effect, uh, it could actually be beneficial. Experiences from the combination and the short and long-term effects, though, are rather scarce. 
Nevertheless, one can observe that after all the experimentation, the world's biggest economies are still struggling. The world's most prominent economists, arguably from different schools of thought, express their viewpoints and might end up with different opinions. In my point of view, the long-term effects, especially of un unconventional monetary policy, still lay ahead of us. Furthermore, the Fed in the U.S. is not trying to increase inflation to help the economy, but they want to sustain asset bubbles, government spending, and monetizing debt. It can't stop non-conventional monetary policy like quantitative easing because they simply can't change the game without stopping it. 